Now, if, if you will, please take your Bibles and turn with me to the prophet Haggai. Haggai, chapter 2. Haggai is after Zephaniah and just before uh, Zechariah. And it's a very short book, just two chapters nestled in between these other prophets. And uh, I'm going to read this morning, picking up with verse 20 to the end of chapter 2. So it's chapter 2, verse 20 to the end of the chapter. <clears throat> and again, the, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Let's pray together. Our Father, as we come before you this morning, we come with gratitude for your mercies to us throughout this past year. And especially we thank you for the blessings that we've enjoyed this Christmas season as we have remembered uh, these past two Sundays uh, preceding this, the birth of our Savior. And many of us have gathered with our families yesterday to enjoy the holiday season. And uh, Lord, we are mindful of how you have abundantly poured out your blessings upon us temporally and then especially uh, spiritually and eternally. We thank you for giving us your son who became a babe and lived as a man, a perfect and holy life and fulfilled all righteousness on behalf of his people and who was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross where he paid the debt of our sin and he redeemed and reconciled us to you, all who believe upon him. We thank you so much for this great gospel. And now as we come to the end of another year, we look ahead to a new year. We pray that you would come by your spirit and help us to understand your word today and its relevance to us. And Lord, may it be a means of equipping us and preparing us for the year ahead and helping us to look back on the year that has passed. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. If you've been with us, uh, you will know that the last two Sundays before this, we really uh, focused more on the Christmas season. Uh, we sang just about every Christmas hymn that we could think of that we know. And uh, also, um, that was the focus of the last three messages, was we opened up Mary's Magnificat, her song of praise at the, uh, the birth of the child, the child that was in her womb. And, and now today, you know, it was kind of a challenge for me because I thought about the fact that we've come to the end of the year. And ordinarily, I like to give a, a message that's kind of geared toward the end of the year. Yet at the same time, the way the calendar works out, uh, the last Sunday in the year is also the, the very day immediately after Christmas. And so while we're transitioning really to focus on uh, looking at the past year, looking ahead to the new year, I tried to think of a text that I thought would kind of bring in both of those ideas in a way that could be helpful to us. And that's part of what led me to the text I want to consider this morning. Now, in my reading of it, you may immediately think, well, I don't see how this text has anything to do with that. But I hope that you will see as we begin to open it up and consider what the message of this, this uh, was to Zerubbabel and what its message is. Uh, for us. I believe it was William Shakespeare who once said that all the world is a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances and one man in his time plays many parts. Well, that I think is an interesting way uh, to look at life. And perhaps, uh, though uh, maybe not completely accurate, there is some truth in it. Viewed from a biblical perspective, world history is indeed the unfolding of a great drama. The author of this drama is God. 
the star of the drama is Christ, and each of us are actors in this great drama. And this drama has four acts, four main acts. The, uh, the first, the drama begins with creation. The second act is the fall. The third act is redemption, an act that has several interconnected scenes, uh, the implications of which continue on until this present time. And then the final act is the consummation, when all of God's redemptive purposes in Christ will come to their ultimate fruition. So each of us here today are caught up in this divine drama, and we each have a part and a role to play in it. But what is that part? What is that role? As I look back over this past year and as I look forward to a new year, how does this day that I live in fit? Where do I fit in the unfolding of God's purposes? What is God doing in my day and how do I relate to it in my life? Perhaps you've asked yourself that question from time to time. <clears throat> well, a long time ago, there was a man named Zerubbabel who probably wrestled with these very questions. And here in our text this morning, he receives from God a very personal response. A response that, though directly addressed to him, has some very practical implications and is very, very relevant for all of us here today. Let me just briefly explain the context and the situation. As you know, the history of the nation of Israel particularly after the reign of King David and his son Solomon, had been one of increasing and progressive apostasy from God. The kingdom divided after Solomon uh, into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom <clears throat> quickly plunged into such wickedness that God gave them up to judgment. And the northern kingdom was destroyed and overrun by the Assyrians in 722 B.C., the southern, southern kingdom, which had as its kings the descendants of David, and its capital was in Jerusalem, and which was also the temple of God, but though not as quickly as the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah eventually went down the same road of idolatry and apostasy until finally God raised up the Babylonians as his scourge. We've, been, we've recently seen that in our study of the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, besieged the city of Jerusalem in 605 B.C., and the Lord gave the king of Judah into his hands. And this was the beginning of three deportations of the Jews from their homeland. And eventually in 587 BC, the city of Jerusalem was completely destroyed by the Babylonians and the temple was flattened to the ground. But then after the Persians conquered Babylon in 539 BC, some of the Jews were allowed by king, uh, the king of Persia, King Cyrus the Persian, they were allowed to return to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. So a remnant under the leadership of this man mentioned in our text, Zerubbabel, returned. And he was appointed the governor of Judah, though still under the authority of the Persian government. And so here they are, this little remnant of Jews, still under Persian rule. And at first they began this work of rebuilding the temple with great enthusiasm and zeal. But then Satan began to throw obstacles in their path. And instead of standing up to those obstacles and pressing through them, they laid aside the work. And they became so preoccupied with building their own houses and providing for their own comforts so that the work was suspended for approximately 15 to 16 years. And it was at this time that God raised up the prophets Haggai and Zechariah to reprove the people and to call them back to the work of rebuilding the temple. And we have the record of, in this book, of four specific messages that Haggai gave to these people at various dates. These, each of these messages are dated for us. He gave them at the various dates that are mentioned. Now, the prophet's first message to the people is given in chapter 1, and it was one of rebuke. He reproved them for their neglect of the work. And how was that message received? Well, the scripture tells us that in response to Haggai's preaching, the people repented and the work was taken up again. But then we come to chapter 2, verse 1, 
Only It's only a little less than a month after the work was taken back up, and the word of the Lord comes to Haggai again. Now, previously, the problem with the Jewish remnant was self-interest and worldliness that kept them from the work. But now the problem was discouragement. They were discouraged as they looked at the work they were doing. Uh, compared to the, the glory of Solomon's temple, this little temple that they were building seemed so shabby and insignificant. What's the use? Why go on fooling ourselves? And they were tempted to quit. So while the first message was one of rebuke, Haggai's second message was one of encouragement. He promised them that though this temple was lacking in outward glory, there were better days coming, that they were building more than they could actually understand or see right now. But then beginning with verse 10 of chapter 2, we have the third message of Haggai to the people. As Haggai's first message was one of rebuke, his second message was one of encouragement. His third message contains a little bit of both. But then we come to our text this morning where we have Haggai's fourth message. And this fourth message was given on the same day as the third message. But this time the message is a word of encouragement that is directed specifically to this man, the governor of Judah, Zerubbabel. And let me just read it to us again now that you have that background. And again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord. So here is Zerubbabel, and surely he must have wondered at times what in the world God is doing. Yes, they've been able to return to Jerusalem. Yes, they're trying to rebuild the temple, but still at this point the Davidic throne has been cast down. God's people are still under the rule of heathen powers, and there is no Davidic king in this temple that they're building. Look at it. It doesn't seem like much. We read in Ezra that some of the older men who were among them who had seen the glory of the previous temple, that as they were raising this new temple, they wept because it was so, I guess you could say, so, so lacking and so, so insignificant, it seemed to them, in comparison to Solomon's temple. And they wept as it was at the dedication of this new temple which was still yet to come, but would come very soon. Now, I'm sure Zerubbabel must have greatly struggled at times with discouragement, maybe even a bit of disillusionment. I think the very nature of the message given to him here points to that. He must have wondered, Lord, is this all there is? What about your great works on behalf of your people in times past? What about the promises you made to our fathers long ago? What about the covenant you made with David. Look at us, this motley, unimpressive, ragtag remnant of Jews on this little spot of land that compare, compared to the whole earth is just a speck, just a dot on the map. Here we are, surrounded by hostile powers, subject to heathen rulers, surrounded by rubble and decay, barely getting by, striving one stone at a time to build some semblance of a temple while the people living around us taunt us and laugh at us. What does it all mean? What does my life mean? How does it all fit? Lord, are you really there? Are you really with us? Have your promises failed? Are they really true? Will they come to nothing after all? Have you ever had questions like that? Well, these are the very questions that God addresses in this, the fourth and last message of Haggai, the prophet. And I, I want to say I found Ralph, Del Ralph Davis, as I often do, uh, whom I draw from at a number of points along the way here, very helpful thinking through the practical relevance of this passage. And God's message here to Zerubbabel, and what is this message to us? It can be summarized, I think, 
uh, under three simple headings. And I'm, I'm going to use three headings to try to summarize God's message to Zerubbabel and to us. And just state them kind of uh, as uh, just stating the, it's kind of state the application at the very beginning and then open it up. First of all, God says to Zerubbabel, trust in my sovereign control of human history. Trust in my sovereign control of human history. Notice the repetition of the personal pronoun, I. God tells Zerubbabel what he is going to do. <clears throat> I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots. Verse 23, I will take you, Zerubbabel. I will make you like a signet ring. I have chosen you, says the Lord. Now, before we even try to understand what all of that means, there's one message that comes through loud and clear. God is asserting that he is in control of human history. God is not in heaven anxiously biting his fingernails, uh, wondering what am I going to do, How, figuring out what to do next. History isn't spinning out of control with God desperately trying to grab hold of the reins. God is in control. The sovereign God controls all of the events of history for his purposes. And here we have a powerful affirmation of the absolute sovereignty of God. Here we see that God has a plan for history. But not only does he have a plan, he works his plan. He accomplishes his plan. He brings it to pass. He doesn't say, I hope to shake heaven and earth. I hope to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. Zerubbabel, I really desire to take you and to make you my signet ring. I sure hope you'll be okay with that. And that that works out that way. No, he says, I will do these things. I will bring them to pass. Now, what exactly do we mean when we speak of the sovereignty of God? We say, we hear that spoken of a lot, people using that language, the sovereignty of God. But what is the sovereignty of God? Well, a sovereign is one who is supreme and independent in his authority. In other words, when we say that God is sovereign, we are saying that God is God. That God is king upon a throne of supreme power and authority, and there is no throne above his or next to his with which he shares that authority and power. There is no one with whom he must consult before he can exercise that power. He is subject to no will but his own. He consults with no one but himself when he wills and when he plans and when he purposes and when he acts and whatever he purposes, he brings to pass. He directs every process and orders every event for the fulfilling of his own eternal plan. That's what we mean when we speak of the sovereignty of God. Now notice in our text, he doesn't say merely that I'm aware that these things are going to happen that he merely foreknows or foresees what will happen. No, it is he who brings these things to pass. He is in control of human history. It's true that God foresees everything that will happen, but it's very important for us to understand that he foresees what will happen because he has determined what will happen. And he brings it to pass according to his providential workings within the world, in the world that he's made. That's the God of the Bible. A God of absolute sovereignty, directing every process and every development and ordering every event of history for the fulfilling of his own purposes. Which are ultimately the glory of his name and the good of his people. Now, how should that truth of God's sovereign control of human history affect those of us who are Christians? How is it intended to affect Zerubbabel? Well, there are many ways it should affect us. It should produce humility in God's presence. It should produce in us a spirit of worship. But more specifically, with reference to the context of the book of Haggai, the reality of God's sovereignty ought to produce, first of all, an unshakable confidence in the purpose of God for our lives. This is one of the things God is saying to Zerubbabel. I'm in control. I have a plan. I have a purpose. 
for your life and in all that is happening right now at this point in history. And I will accomplish that purpose. From your limited vantage point, it may not seem to make a lot of sense right now. But trust me. You know, brothers and sisters, Romans 8.28 is just a lot of sentimental talk. Unless the God of whom it speaks is sovereign. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. And why do all things work together for the good of God's people? There's only one reason, because we have a sovereign God who is controlling all things in his universe. And nothing comes into your life that is outside of his sovereign, infinitely wise plan and providence. But secondly... This reality of God's sovereignty should also fill us with unshakable confidence in the ultimate triumph of the gospel. God's redemptive plan in Jesus Christ. The gospel, we have a sovereign God who has purpose to save a vast multitude that no man can number from every kindred, tribe, nation, and tongue. A God who has promised that Christ shall have the heathen for his inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for his possession. Psalm 2. And what this sovereign God has purposed to do will certainly come to pass. And that should give us confidence and boldness in all of our gospel endeavors. It was this conviction of the sovereignty of God that enabled a poor monk by the name of Martin Luther to stand against all of the power of Rome and and all the kings of Europe with all of their armies and all of their persecuting threats, it was his unshakable confidence in the purpose of God that enabled him to stand against them all. That confidence that he so powerfully captures in the words of his hymn that he wrote. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. Well, dear friends, we face many mighty forces in our day, don't we? There are many barriers that raise themselves up against the church and against the progress of the gospel. This society we live in has its rulers, its movers and shakers, its political rulers and economic rulers, its scientific and technological rulers, its educational and philosophical and sociological and cultural elite who are molding and shaping this society. And they're awesome and they're, they're powerful. And they are advocating and pushing us, attempting to push us further and further away from a biblical worldview. But as powerful as they are and as influential as they are, They are nothing before God. And we can boldly say with Luther, we will not fear. For God has willed, ultimately, when all is said and done, His truth to triumph through us. And that leads us now to something else God is saying here to Zerubbabel and to us in this passage. Not only trust in my sovereign control of human history, secondly, expect the ultimate destruction of my and my people's enemies. Listen, picking up with verse 21. B. I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. Now, what in the world is God talking about? Well, this is common apocalyptic language that speaks of the judgments of God that will fall upon his and his people's enemies. Motyer in his commentary calls this the literary equivalent of an impressionistic painter giving general tone and effect without elaborate detail. And I think that's a very good illustration. What does he mean by that? Well, if you know anything about impressionism when it comes to painting, an impressionistic painting, one of the characteristics of that kind of painting is the effort to capture the essence of the subject that's being painted rather than its details. Maybe you've seen a painting that it all kind of looks blurred a little bit, but you can tell it's a pond and flowers and trees around it, but they're not clearly defined. The details aren't. It's capturing the essence of the subject. Without the details, that's, that's called impressionism. Well, in a sense, that's what Haggai is giving us here in this prophecy. 
He's painting a picture with broad strokes and Bible symbols of the terrible judgments of God upon the earth. He says, I will shake heaven and earth. This shaking will not only be on the earth, but of the heavens as well. It will be cosmic in its scale. A shaking of the whole created realm of heaven and earth. It will be an earth shaking and heaven shaking event. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of Gentile kingdoms. God will annihilate the power bases of unbelieving world empires. The Hebrew word translated overthrow here would conjure up in the mind of a person familiar with Old Testament history uh, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. For this Hebrew word, this word is constantly used in the Old Testament to refer back to that event. That day is also compared here to the destruction of Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down. And then he adds, everyone by the sword of his brother. And this has overtones of, of the victory given to Gideon. You remember when God judged the Midianites and each man turned against his brother in fear and panic. And so we have this highly symbolic language of judgment. Now, the question immediately comes to mind, when does this threatened judgment happen? that God is speaking of here to Zerubbabel. <clears throat> was this something that was to happen in that generation? Or is this something that happened at some point in history down the road from this time? Or is it referring to something that is still, even in our day, yet to happen? Well, I believe in one sense the answer to each of those questions is yes. Yes. This is a description of the ultimate destruction of all of God's enemies, but that judgment is both yet to come, and at the same time, there are foretastes of it throughout history. We see it in the overthrow of Sodom, in the drowning of Pharaoh's army in the Red Sea, in the destruction of the Midianites by Gideon and the 300, with Nebuchadnezzar, as we saw in our study of the book of Daniel, stricken with insanity and caused to grovel in the fields like a wild animal. We see it in Herod lying on the ground, writhing in pain, his bowels eaten with worms. We see foretastes of it throughout the whole course of world history to this day. Earthquakes, tsunamis, pandemics, wars and rumors of wars. These are all pointers to the judgment to come. When Mussolini, the Italian dictator, was in power, school children in Tunisia were taught to say the following blasphemous prayer. I believe in the supreme leader, creator of the black shirts, and in Jesus Christ. On the 29th of April, 1945, he was hung upside down along with his mistress in public disgrace. Hitler and the Nazis boasted that the Third Reich would last for a thousand years. The thousand-year Reich, they called it. Twelve years, four months, and eight days later, it came crashing down. And Hitler himself committed suicide. These are all foretastes of the judgment to come. There's another sense in which these words in Haggai were partially fulfilled when Christ came the first time <clears throat> by his death and resurrection. He spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly. He defeated Satan and sin and secured the ultimate overthrow of evil. However, though that victory was secured on the cross, the battle is still on. And the consummation is not yet. There is a final judgment to come. And we know that that is the ultimate reference of our text. Because these words of Haggai are quoted again in the New Testament with reference to that final day of judgment. Hebrews 12, 25 and following reads, See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they, the children of Israel, during the time of Moses, did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. Now listen whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, and then he quotes from the prophet Haggai, yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. 
And he goes on to say, this indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of the things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. And there Haggai's prophecy is clearly quoted with reference to the final judgment. 2 Peter 3.10 tells us the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are there in it will be burned. Matthew 24, 47, Jesus said, For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape, Revelation 6, 15. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man will hide themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and cry to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to? to stand. It is coming, dear friends. It's coming. And this was God's message to Zerubbabel and to us. Expect the ultimate destruction of all of the enemies of God and his people. Now, that truth here is intended to be an encouragement to God's people. I should also cause us to be grieved and to be burdened for those who are lost. It should cause us to warn people, to pray for them, that they might be saved. It should motivate us to preach the gospel and to call men and women to repentance and faith in Christ before it's too late. But again, also this truth of the God's judgment is intended in Scripture to be a comfort to God's people. There is a sorrow and a grief and even a sense of outrage that we sometimes feel over the wickedness and injustice that we see in the world today. Perhaps we're even tempted at times to doubt and to wonder if God is really there. And if God really cares, why doesn't he do something? We may even be tempted to, to doubt, uh, completely doubt our faith, and to walk away from the faith. Such was the case with Asaph. You remember Psalm 73. He talks about how he went through this time of struggle over this very thing. He says, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, he said, surely I have cleansed my heart in vain. My life is difficult, full of trials as I try to live for God. But here are these people who care nothing for you, God. They care nothing for your law. They scoff at your word. They live as they please. And yet they seem to be full and healthy and carefree. But then he goes on to describe in that psalm how he was delivered from this temptation. He says, when I went into the sanctuary of God and then I understood their end, they have, may have more than heart could wish now. They may scoff and speak wickedly and set their mouths against heaven. But oh, how they will be brought to desolation in a moment and utterly consumed with terrors. He writes, there is coming a day when all wrongs will be made right. There is coming a day when our God, in the person of Christ, our righteous King, the Lord Jesus, will execute justice upon the earth. He's coming to judge the world in righteousness. And let me say that just as that ought to be a source of encouragement to God's people, if you sit here this morning outside of Jesus Christ, it ought to make you tremble. It ought to make you tremble. It ought to awaken you to the fact that that day is coming. And no man knows the day or the hour. But Jesus said, I, I think I've told you this before. Robert Murray McShane uh, was gathering with a group of pastors to pray. And he asked them, do you believe the Lord Jesus will return today? Honestly, do you believe the Lord Jesus will return today? And several of them said, well, honestly, I don't think he will return today. And McShane quoted our Lord's statement, In an hour that you think not, the Son of Man comes. He's coming. Are you prepared? Are you ready? What an awful day that will be for those who are outside of Christ, those who have gone their own way, s snubbed their noses at the gospel, and have refused to repent and to put their trust in Jesus Christ. Let that not be you. 
So God's message to Zerubbabel and to us, as we come to the end of another year, we look ahead to the new year, is trust in my sovereign control of human history. Expect the ultimate destruction of the enemies of God and His people. And then thirdly, be assured of my faithfulness to my promises. Be assured of my faithfulness to my promises. I direct your attention now to verse 23. <clears throat> In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheltiel, says the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, <clears throat> says the Lord of hosts. So God gives this personal word to Zerubbabel. I will take you. I will make you like a signet ring. I have chosen you. Now, what in the world is that all about? Well, we need to understand who exactly this Zerubbabel guy is, okay? Zerubbabel was the grandson of King Jehoiachin. He's also referred to as Coniah or Jeconiah. He was really the last official king of Judah. The reason I say that was because there was another king that Nebuchadnezzar put, it, put on the throne as a kind of a puppet king, who, uh, Zedekiah. But Zedekiah was not in the direct line uh, Jeho of David. Jehoiachin was the last really official king of Judah. Jehoiachin had been carried captive to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. Now, you remember that the Lord had made a promise to King David long before this. We first read it in 2 Samuel 7. He promised that David's throne would continue forever. And he promised that David's son would establish the kingdom and he would rebuild, he would build, excuse me, the temple of the Lord. And as this promise is further unfolded in the Psalms and the prophets, we find that its ultimate fulfillment was to be found in the promised Messiah. The Christ to come from the line of David. In him, the throne of David was to be established forever, even for eternity. And he would build the house of the Lord, God's new covenant temple, the church. But look at what's happened. Judah, for her wickedness, is destroyed by the Babylonians. The children of Judah are carried away into captivity. The throne of David has been cast down. Jehoiachin dies in Babylon. And there is no more king over Israel from the line of David. What happened to God's promise? <clears throat> what about God's covenant with David? Now, that question is the context of a very important psalm, Psalm 89. Let's turn over there just a moment. Psalm 89. This question, what happened to God's promise? What about God's covenant with David? This particular psalm was written after the captivity. Uh, the inscription at the beginning identifies its author as Ethan the Ezraite. And let's pick up with verse 34. He begins by underscoring this covenant that God has made. My covenant I will not break. He's quoting God's own language. My covenant I will not break nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever and his throne is the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. But now notice what he goes on to say. But you have cast off and abhorred. You have been furious with your anointed. You have renounced the covenant of your servant. You have profaned his crown by casting it to the ground. You have broken down all his hedges. You have brought his strongholds to ruin. All who pass by the way plunder him. He is a reproach to his neighbors. You have exalted the right hand of his adversaries. You have made all his enemies rejoice. You have also turned back the edge of his sword and have not sustained him in the battle. You have made his glory cease and cast his throne down to the ground. So the captivity has come. David's throne has been cast down. Jehoiachin has been carted off to Babylon and he dies there. And the great question of the psalmist is, what does this mean, O God? 
How can this be? Does this mean that you have forgotten your covenant? Does this mean that God has failed to keep His promise? Notice what He says in verse 49. Lord, where are your former loving kindnesses, which you swore to David in your truth? So this was the great dilemma. This was the great question raised by the Babylonian captivity. And now as we turn back to our text, this helps us to see the significance of God's word concerning Zerubbabel. In that day, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, and will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you. What's a signet ring? <clears throat> well, when a king, a king wanted to affix his seal, his signature, as it were, to a document, he would take his signet ring and press it into soft wax, and then he would, he, would, he would seal. That would be his mark, okay? It was worn on the right hand or around the neck of the king. It was a symbol of honor and authority and of special relationship. Well, we find something interesting with reference to Jehoiachin that is spoken in Jeremiah chapter 22. There God said through the prophet, As I live, though Kaniah, Jehoiachin, king of Judah, were the signet on my right hand, yet I would pluck you off. And he goes on to say that he's going to give him into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And that's what he did. So the signet ring of the Davidic line, as it were, was plucked off with Jehoiachin. The Davidic line had run into the sand. But here God is saying to Zerubbabel, Jehoiachin's grandson, through you I'm going to reverse the curse. Zerubbabel, you're going to be my signature in history that I will bring my promise to David to fruition. You see, Zerubbabel is mentioned here not so much for what he was personally, but for what he represented as a descendant of the house of David. He himself never reigned as king. He had no crown to wear, no empire to rule. And though he was governor over this little remnant of Jews, he was still under Persian dominion. However, when we come to the New Testament, when we come to that first Christmas, when the Christ was born into the world, the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, we find that Jesus Christ was a direct descendant of this man, Zerubbabel. The Davidic line running straight to Christ runs right through this man. God had chosen Zerubbabel to be the one through whom his promise would continue to move forward until the Christ should come. The New Testament begins with these words in Matthew 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob, and so on, and so on. And then we come to David and the Davidic kings. David begot Solomon. Solomon begot Rehoboam, and so on. And then we read Josiah begot Jeconiah, or Jehoiachin, and his brothers. About the time they were carried away to Babylon. And there is no more Davidic kings after that. The tree of David is cut down. It's just a stump now. You remember the prophet spoke that there was a time coming when there would be a, a branch that would spring up from the stump of David. God preserves the Davidic line. As we then go on to read, after they were brought to Babylon, Jehoiachin begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel. And then on it goes till we get to Christ himself. So what is God's message in these words to Zerubbabel? Of course, at that time, this man could not have possibly understood all that we understand now on this side of the coming of Christ. But the thrust of the message was clear. Be assured of my faithfulness to my promises. In spite of the sin and failure of your fathers... In spite of how things may seem at this present time, take heart. You, Zerubbabel, are my signature in history that my promise to David will not fail. You see, Zerubbabel here is a forerunner and a type of Jesus Christ. That one who would build the temple of the Lord. Not something made of brick and mortar over in a little piece of land in modern day Palestine. But the temple, that spiritual temple of which we are being built up a spiritual house, a dwelling place of God by the Spirit. Ephesians chapter 2. We as living stones are being built up as a spiritual temple 
the dwelling place of the Spirit, the dwelling place of God upon earth. And that temple is being extended over the whole earth through the preaching of the gospel as men and women are converted and are brought into the Christian church. And Zerubbabel is a forerunner. He's a type of Christ, the one who would build the temple of the Lord. And he and the work that God had called him to do at that particular time in redemptive history was God's seal, God's pledge that his promises would not fail. Well, surely the consideration of those things ought to strengthen our confidence in the promises of God. When God makes a promise, he keeps it. There's an inevitability to it. Nothing can ever frustrate God's kingdom plan. Let the passage of time, let sin and our failures and follies do what they can. God's promises will all be fulfilled. Sin can't stop it. The passage of time can't keep it back. Even the sins of God's people can't stop it. Satan can't stop it. The princes and rulers, the presidents and congresses, and the movers and shakers of this present world cannot stop it. All that God has purposed to do, he will do. And all that he has promised, he will bring to pass. This is what he's communicating to Zerubbabel and to us in this passage. Indeed, he has confirmed his promises with an oath. You know, God doesn't have to make an oath. You know... In human transactions, serious transactions, we, we have an oath, maybe in a court of law, or, or you, you sign something, you have a notary, because it, humans have the tendency of not being trust, able to be trusted, right? Just to take our word for it. Well, God never lies. He doesn't need to, to make an oath, but he knows our weakness and our struggle to believe his promises. And he condescends to our weakness by confirming his promises with an oath. He makes a covenant, not just his promise to David, but all of the promises of the gospel are covenant promises ratified by the blood of Christ. For example, in the new covenant, he promises to all who put their trust in his son that our sins and iniquities he will remember no more against us. He keeps that promise. That he will write his law in our hearts. I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. He promises to never leave us or forsake us. That he will supply all of our need according to his riches and glory. He promises that all things will work together for our good. That there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that nothing shall ever be able to separate us from the love of God. He promises to keep us and to preserve us all the way into his heavenly kingdom. For according to Revelation 21, God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away, and there will be no more sin. And we will worship him and serve him with unsinning hearts as we enjoy all the blessings of a new and renovated earth. And the will of God will be done on earth as it is done now in heaven. Rejoice, brothers and sisters, that we serve a God who is doggedly, determinedly, is that a word? Committed to keeping his promises. And he will keep them. Well, the book of Haggai ends at this point. <clears throat> Zerubbabel must get back to work. The hard work of building that little temple. One stone at a time. We never really hear about this man again until we come to the genealogy of Christ. He was just faithful with what gave, God gave him to do at that time in his generation. And that's all that God was asking him to do. Just trust me. I'm in control. Right will win out in the end. And my promises will not fail. Just get on with what I've given you to do, Zerubbabel, and leave the rest to me. And that's what he did. It wasn't very exciting. It wasn't very spectacular. Indeed, many, many years went by after Zerubbabel before Christ actually came. We have the whole intertestamental period. 400 years go by. Nothing much happens. Nothing really exciting. The only biblical record we have of that period is so-and-so begot so-and-so. 
so-and-so begot so-and-so, so-and-so begot so-and-so. It was all rather ordinary. But then at the appointed time, Christ came. Well, so it is, brothers and sisters. You know, we can tend to think that there's, unless there's a lot of noise and excitement, nothing's being accomplished. But God's ways are not our ways. The loud, the exciting, the extraordinary are the exception in redemptive history, not the norm. Much of God's work is carried on in very silent, unexpect, un unspectacular ways. And the silent ways of God continue today. And what God calls us to do as we look ahead to this new year is simply to be faithful. To be faithful. Be faithful with what I've put into your hands to do. That hard work of building my church one stone, one brick at a time. That hard work of teaching your family the things of God. Raising your children for the glory of God. Seeking to be a witness and a testimony in the place of work where God has given to you. Seeking to shine as a light in this crooked and perverse generation. To be faithful to the Lord. To do your part in strengthening and building His temple, His church. Again, one stone, one brick at a time. And though at times it may seem that little is being accomplished. And the enemies of Christ's people seem to have the upper hand. Remember God's word to Zerubbabel. Long, long time ago. Trust in God's sovereign control of human history. Expect the ultimate destruction of all the enemies of God and his church. And be assured that God will be faithful to his promises. And just be faithful. Just keep on. As we say sometimes, keep on keeping on. Or to put it in the language of the Apostle Paul. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Isn't that basically God's message to Zerubbabel? And it's his message to us this morning. So may God help us to take it to heart. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you today for your holy word. We thank you for the principles that are articulated and we're reminded of even in this very simple text and of their relevance to us. We thank you for this past year, how you have preserved us and kept us through all of the trials and the ups and downs of life in a sin-cursed world. We thank you for how you have blessed us as a church this year, how you have added to us, how we've seen conversions, we've seen stones added to the temple, spiritual stones as it, is, as it were. Lord, we do confess there are times when we look at the work of our hands and it seems so small and insignificant in light of the great forces that are raging against your church in the world today. But we trust you. We know that you are sovereign, that you will do all of your holy will, that you will fulfill all of your promises. And we pray that we would be encouraged by these things to persevere in our faith and our devotion to Jesus Christ. We thank you today for the salvation that we have in him, that we know that there are better days coming, that the day is coming when he will receive all the glory that is his due. When every knee, those who are under the earth, as Paul says, those who are on the earth and above the earth, every living moral creature will bow the knee to Jesus Christ and confess him as Lord. We long for that day. And for those who have refused to do so, Lord, we pray that you will work in their hearts to see their lost condition, that they sit here even today under the curse of your broken law, that there is only one way to be delivered from that curse, and that is through him who took that curse upon himself when he died upon the cross and was raised from the dead. And we pray, Father, that you would draw them to him, that they might, they might know the great salvation that is in Jesus Christ. Now go with us and help us to honor you throughout this day. 
And as we come back to worship you this evening, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.